top with no bag on. Look at that content. Awful, awful. Matt does participate in the disease process. So we start with the similarities between Yoni's disease and Crohn's disease. There are quite a few, they're quite striking, and there are, of course, the historical reason for suspecting Matt. There's quite a list of them still here. But there are some problems with this particular approach. The analytical problems of a pure clinical approach, particularly in a disease as complex as this, is difficult to actually analyse. To start with, there are many subclinical cases, and um, there's certainly in Rioni's disease, and until later we'll actually see that this probably occurs also in Crohn's disease as well. There are many degrees of severity that we can actually have with the disease, and therefore the detection isn't necessarily correlated with the clinical pres presentation. So what you end up with is actually looking at this disease, there's no real single predictable outcome. So it's very difficult to actually study what we're looking for and find a common biomarker. And it's this common biomarker we want to really find for Crohn's disease. We have a wide variation of clinical manifestations that we're looking at, but we actually haven't got anything common we can actually say is in all of our patients that we can measure specifically with our, anal anal our analysis. Now we know Crohn's disease starts by uh, tissue damage, perhaps reducing the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the gut wall will actually become more leaky. Organisms from the lumen can uh, enter into the gut wall, penetrate, and they're presented by a Th1 bias that we all know exists in our animals, but also in our Crohn's patients. And they, they, this Th1 bias sustains this inflammation, increases the cytokine responses, produces more tissue damage, and we get this cycle of chronic disinformation, the chronic inflammation that goes on. But underlying this, this is the important bit. We have this cycle, but underlying this, what is actually going on here, what is actually forcing this to cycle to occur, is in fact a chronic immune dysregulation. And this chronic immune dysregulation itself is affected by other factors. It's certainly affected by genetic susceptibility and the persistence of some sort of environmental agent that we know occurs because of the epidemiology of Crohn's disease. So the important point here, if you look at this overview, is in fact the environmental agent here is in fact not really a direct cause of the information. And in fact, the environmental is just a chronic trigger of the immune dysregulation, and it is this pathway that we should be actually looking when we're looking in our studies. So I think I don't have to uh, comment too much about the fact that map prevalence in wild and domestic animals is very high. I'm sure quite a few of you would probably agree with that statement already. 70% prevalence in MAP uh, USDA dairy herds, and of course an increasing prevalence with Crohn's disease, and worryingly, this is also most in prevalence with our pediatric patients. This is quite a good argument for Crohn's disease and paratuberculosis, but it's not the argument. It's not an argument that can show that it is proof, but it is part of it. And it's a, it goes along with the next step. And in fact, all the steps that are going along here. We know that there are vectors of transmission. We know there are viable vectors of transmission. Viable map coming down the rivers, viable map in our environment, viable map in the meat products, in our dairy products. We can also collect some of those viable map transmission vectors to Crohn's disease clusters in some cases. But actually, transmission really needs to be shown if we can actually show specific transfer between animals, specific and humans. So I haven't got any examples of that. If we look at the data, there are some places in the world where in fact there are predominant epidemiological map types. Sassari, for example, in, in Sardinia. The most predominant type there is a sheep type. If you look at the Indian uh, um, New Delhi, look at the samples from the Sings uh, data, we see bison types. We then look at the Crohn's patients from these particular areas, again, we see exactly the same predominant type found in the Crohn's patients as we do in the animals. Further, the animal workers, the animal workers that actually work with MAP, are significantly more likely to be infected with MAP. This is obvious transmission. If we look at we look at Rod Chiodini's work, this is a long time ago, 1996 IAP. We still have evidence still here of animal workers, and he doesn't call them normals, he calls them health, uh, human healthcare workers, I'm surprised, 
uh, but you have a significant amount of animal workers over the top of health of pet abnormals actually producing antibodies. So what does this mean? Well, it means that normals are actually seeing paratuberculosis. This is very encouraging. Specifically, if you actually go to use a vaccine, vaccines will work if we can actually make the immune system see paratuberculosis. So a high map exposure correlates with increased immune recognition. Something I'm going to come back to a little bit later on. So now we have reservoirs, we have transmission. Do we have invasion? And is this invasion something that is going to happen from an active point of view? It's very important to show that map isn't just sitting on the surface. Map isn't a commensal. Map is an active invader. Can it infect also the gut in the medium of the humans? So here is one of the most extraordinary experiments I've had, had read this year. Okay, this is from Nagel uh, from uh, Nagel Spiegel's work from the University of uh, the Hebrew University in Israel. Now here, here we've got 80 samples from human ilium. This is human fetal ilium that they've had from donors and they've xenographed onto skid moths, allowed to develop into normal human ilium. Then they've infected them with paratuberculosis, or a control snake martis, and then found out what's happening. And what they see, what they see is the paratuberculosis, which is these green spots here, are infected inside the epithelium. And here, the snake martis is sitting on the villial layer. So here, in a third of these donors, we see active invasion, and this is associated with severe inflammation in this epithelium, and epithelial damage is going on. This is MAP being active invader. Why should it invade only about a third of these patients? Well, they are all, they are Ashkenazi Jews, they're the donors. That we expect from Ashkenazi Jews to actually have mutations in the NOD2 card 15 gene. So this is a very interesting gene from Crohn's disease point of view, mainly because it's also associated with the panis cells and the panis cells of producing this alpha defensive HD5. And in my laboratory, we've been looking at what the uh, relationship of HD5 and paratuberculosis is. By actually treating HD5 onto paratuberculosis, we see nothing in culture. HD5 doesn't work as a normal antibiotic. It doesn't affect MAC at all for its actual culture. But it does stick to the cell wall. It sticks to the cell wall probably on the fuco cell residues. And if you feed treated paratuberculosis to macrophages in humans, only about half as many go in. So what's the inference for this? Well, the inference is that non-2 mutations will actually lead to HD5 depletion in patients. It doesn't have to be Crohn's patients. It can be any patient with, a normal, with an abnormal gene. And that would lead to an increase in paratuberculosis probability of infection. So to this, does this actually occur? And I'll probably show you some data that actually does occur. But to make sure it does occur first, we need to have good tests. We need to know that paratuberculosis is in our samples and be sure that paratuberculosis is viable within our samples. Always a problem, we've been here at the IAPs now for many, many years, always arguments about PCR, always arguments about culture. <laughs> Recently, this study here, 